Well, hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Secrets to Real Estate Investing by House Flip Masters. Today, I'm really excited to have someone new on that I have not known for a while. So I love meeting new people in the world. I've kind of seen him on Facebook and stuff, but I'm really excited to hear more about his story and his transition from being what I call a regular person over to being a real estate investor and hearing all about that. So welcome, Sep. Thank you, Holly. Uh, glad to be on here. <laughs> well, I'm really glad to have you on. Why don't you start by giving us your background, your story, and how you got to where you are today? Sure. Uh, so I have been investing in real estate now for about six years. Uh, prior to that, I, uh, well, I've lived in Orange County all my life, uh, so not too far away from, from you. And um, you know, kind of grew up as a normal kid, um, uh, played video games, you know, liked comic books and all that. And um, I, I was raised in that kind of traditional uh, uh, thought, you know, with parenting, saying go to school, get a job, um, you know, get good grades, and not really as much on the entrepreneurial side of it. So I, I did that, you know, went, went through electrical engineering. And um, when I graduated and finally got into the workforce, that was in about... Uh, August or July 2008. So that's when the economy was just taking a big tank. And um, I, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Office Space, but what I envisioned a job to be like was was very different. So it was a movie from like the late 90s, Jennifer Aniston, really funny movie. But um, it's just basically about you know this company where everyone that works there they're just they're miserable there. They're they're not really living up to their potential. Um, you know, the, the bosses are just kind of typical egotistical, um, you know, not really caring about the, the employees well being or, um, their happiness of the company and it has an effect. Right. So I know it sounds kind of draconian, but <laughs> I, it was, um, it, it was, it was really, um, kind of different than, than what I envisioned. So spent, you know, I got out of school at 26 and spent a good part of like 20 years of my life going to school. And then. Four months of that job, I got laid off. And, oh um, my gosh! What yeah. a, what a, like, oh, that's a killer. You work your whole life up to that, and then you get laid off. So, right. you're like, oh my gosh, redirection, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and prior to that, um, I had a, a coworker that I was working with um, who said, you know, hey, the stock market's it's doing really, it's it's pretty low right now. It's a good time to buy. So he was telling me his his uncle had made some really good moves and and. Uh, said he was investing like $20,000 in Washington Mutual. So I thought it would be a good idea for me to take my life savings and put into that stock. And you know how that went. So. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of, kind of learned it the hard way. Um, so it was laid off, you know, lost my savings, um, moved back in with parents. And um, it was, uh, it was kind of a surprise because, you know, the expenses kept rolling in every month, but I didn't have any type of income at that time. So thankfully found another job. Um, and at the second job, I, I was just always a little nervous, like, what if, you know, every, all the, all my coworkers and the bosses were always talking about the economy and how, how risky it was and, you know, sales were down and all that stuff. So I, I wanted to work as hard as I could, but at the end of the day, I didn't have control of, you know, the bottom line of the company. Um, and around that time, that's, um, that's when I, I, I thought it would be a safer idea for me to go back to school and get my master's degree. So I was wasn't sure if I should get an MBA because I've never taken any business classes or go for my robotics degree, which I, I chose the latter. Hmm. And um, yeah, going full time, uh, going for the master's. And then my cousin said, uh, I, I saw her at a, at a cocktail party one time and she asked me what I was doing. I said, well, ultimately I'd like to start my own business or have some type of investment income because this, this is kind of scary, you know, like any day, you know, I could be out on the, the streets and not have any type of uh, cash flow. So he, uh, she actually recommended I read uh, Robert Kiyosaki's book. Um, and I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I love. But the first book I read was actually Conspiracy of the Rich. And Kiyosaki wrote that during the recession. And he was just kind of explaining how inflation works and how, you know, what, what caused the recession and how he predicted that back in his earlier book, Prophecy. And the light bulb turned on. It was it was kind of like an awakening moment. So I, I got the real estate bug. Um, I, I went into the bank and how much I could qualify for in Orange County. Uh, with the lack of experience I had on my W2, um, I, I probably couldn't even get like a, a bathroom, you know, in a, <laughs> a studio apartment. It was pretty low. <laughs> yeah. 
So, um, and it's, you know, a little more expensive now, but um, I, I was more focused on cash flow. So started looking in um, my own backyard, Mission Viejo, um, then went out to like Anaheim, Corona, Riverside, and it was, everything was just still too expensive at the time. Um, then got into the podcast, so I listened to the real estate guys, um, uh, and, uh, you know, got a little more open to kind of going into the emerging markets. So to this day, I, I currently don't have any properties in California, um, but uh, the, the first two that I bought ended up being in Phoenix, and that was just because seeing where the demographics were going, the baby boomers and, you know, the cost of the ling was so low. So I got all excited. The first new property was, um, it was two flexes, and um, it was just with conventional financing, nothing creative. And I thought what, what would happen on the Performa, what was described on the Performa would be what I could take home. And the reality was it was very different. So it ended up taking me two years. Um, that was December 2010, two years from then until I finally got a dollar worth of cash flow. And that's oh just because, my gosh. Wow. Were yeah. you getting like, were you losing faith and hope like, oh, this is not going to work. This is crazy. Or were you hanging in there going, I know this is going to work. It's going to get better. What was your whole mindset then? Both actually. But I, I had my friends and my, my, my family telling me I was crazy. What are you doing? You should stay in your backyard. Don't go out of state. You know, they, uh, they were kind of making it sound like it was, it was going to a different country. It's like, it's just, it's Phoenix, you know, it's not, it's not that far away. But yeah. Five hour drive. Hours. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but I, I did see the long term cause, um, you know, I, we, I had a lot of, um, eviction problems, property management uh, problems. The third property I bought was another fourplex that was with owner financing and one of the units had a meth lab in there. Um, so here I am, you know, five months into investing and already dealing with a property that has, you know, multiple evictions, meth labs and, uh, you know, tenants leaving, putting bleach on the carpets and bashing in the windows. Oh my gosh. Oh. Yeah. So I, I kind of found out earlier on, um, what my investor identity was. Um, and, and I think that's an important part of uh, real estate investing is, is to find out, you know, who's the customer that you want to serve. And, and I got that from Jay Massey, um, one of my mentors because a lot of times we think that it's just about the property, but there's so much more to it. There's the team, there's the, the area, um, you know, the exit strategy and, um, you know, how long do we want to be on this asset for? And earlier on, I, I was expecting everything to be nice and easy and cash flowing automatically where I could just focus on the job and, and these rental properties on the side would just pay me. Um, but I had to end up putting in more and more time into the real estate. And mm. the good thing is I, I learned a lot about it and my investor had any kind of change along the way. Um, you Can know, you so kind of define for us, like, what does that mean, investor identity? Sure. Um, so a lot of the new investors um, that, that come to me and are asking for advice, you know, they're, they're always asking, you know, where can I find good deals? You know, where, which, what's a good market to invest in? And I always ask them, well, first, who's the customer do you want to serve? Um, how active or passive do you want to be involved with this, right? Because, um, you know, you can be involved in real estate investing and get the benefits, say like interest payments every month and, and just do lending. But then you don't have to worry about contractors. You don't have to worry about finding the next deal, right? You're just the money provider and getting that benefit. And there's other people like me that like to be a little more active and, and actually dealing with the property management companies um, and, and going through, you know, the whole interview process and managing the manager. So I think it's important uh, to start off with one, um, is, the investor, uh, is your investor identity to be active, involved in the deals or to be passive? Uh, so kind of like how on the passive side, you can also relate that to, um, to venture capitalists, right? Where they're just putting the money into the company. So it's the same thing um, with that. And then even beyond that, if you wanna be active, uh, what type of customer do you wanna serve? Do you wanna focus on C-class apartments? Um, do you wanna do beautiful high-end flips like like what you do and what you guys are great at um and you know or do you want to do you know senior living homes do you want to do uh uh you know sober living care like there's all these different customers you can serve with the real estate um you know veterans housing and um uh, you know they even have refugee housing which i just found out about recently so but all of these require uh different types of teams and managers to handle that right like you you probably wouldn't um use the same property manager in, in like an A-class neighborhood as you would in a C-class neighborhood, right? Well, actually, I am my property manager. So, oh, okay. <laughs> I, and I do, I, I don't know if I have any A, yeah, I, get, I probably have some A properties and then some C properties. And just for our listeners so they know, we rate 
houses like and apartments like you get grades in school. So A, B, C, A is the best quality with the best quality tenants. B is probably, you know, not so good. C is going to be about the worst. Have you ever heard of anything less than a C? I haven't. I think that's as low as a scale goes, right? I, it does go down to F, and, I, and I've had those types of properties too. Oh, really? So. <laughs> okay. That's and where that's, the tabs are, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, oh, okay. the, you know, you find the property on the news, and that's when you find the updates. So. <laughs> ah, okay. So, yeah, just so people kind of understand that, that might be new to real estate investing, um, investors that are investing not to flip. Usually you hear that term more for apartments. That's when you get into more of the grading, right? Or do you hear right. it a lot with houses? I haven't heard it with houses so much. I, I think it applies to both because I mean, just the difference is with apartments, you'll have all the units in one address, right? In one building, but you would still have that with, with houses too. And, um, and, it's not that, and it's not to say that if you have a C-class management company that they're that they're not as good as like an A-class, but it's that that C-class manager speaks the language of that C-class tenant, right? Like they'll put Formica instead of granite or, um, you know, maybe it's uh, like a certain color of paint versus, you know, something else. So you want the best quality for each asset class, but just to make sure that they're aligned and they they know how to handle that and serve the tenants. Right. And just to clarify what you said, when you said the best quality for each asset class, that doesn't mean top of the line, but the best suited. Because you're right. I remember hearing Jay Massey say once that, you shouldn't put granite countertops in C-class apartments because even if you got a great deal on the granite, the tenants are going to see it and think, oh, this place is too nice. I can't move in here. I can't take care of this. I can't afford it. Even though the price might be in their price point, their price range, that could definitely happen. I'm guilty of doing that. And I did a condo conversion project in Austin, Texas, and we totally upgraded the kitchens to our Southern California high-end standards. And I think it hurt us. Like we spent more than we needed to and it wasn't the right fit. So that's a really good point that you need to make sure you're outfitting your houses and apartments to the correct spec level. Right. Yeah, definitely a great example of that. And I I, I made those mistakes myself too. So that's kind of, (laughs) but you know, good experience to come out of it. (laughs) Definitely. So you talked a little bit about investor identity. Can you describe for our audience what your identity is? I think you alluded to it. You're active and you're managing managers, but, and then also kind of catch us up to where you're at. What is in your portfolio today and like kind of what you're working on today, like kind of take us through the rest of the process from the beginning problems to where you're at now. Sure. So, um, kind of a summary, I've, uh, to date, I've gone through about, um, uh, 12 property managers. So that's about eight different property management companies. Um, and that's, you know, Sometimes I have to let them go. Sometimes uh, you know they'll fire me as the as the real estate investor. Um, so it's it's not you know it's it's the one type of vendor that you can work with that um, they won't you know like you can um, if you need a house that needs uh, to be painted for example right you you'll have a bunch of painters that want to come and bid on that property right they'll want to do earn your business mm-hmm. but with real estate investing if you have a problem property or say like an apartment complex with high vacancy or a lot of crime. Um, it's, it's going to be hard to get that property manager's attention if, if they can't handle that and if you're not paying them enough for it, right? Because it could take more time than, say, another property three times the size that pays them, you know, four times as much income out of it. So, um, you know, definitely, you know, a good pay, uh, a good team um, does need to be uh, paid, you know, well accordingly. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things you have to keep them accountable, but you don't want to be um, a pushover uh, about it like I was when I first started on. I, uh, earlier on, I'd, I make mistakes of, um, you know, when I have the wrong property management company or the wrong team in place, I kept them too long um, instead of, you know, doing the interview questions upright and and um, and being more diligent about it. Like when I first started investing, I would ask my management companies three questions. Um, how much do you charge? What do you think about the property? And when do you start? And, you know, they hired them right there. Now I take them through like a 90-question interview process. Wow. Um, yeah, and it's just through, you know, earning the stripes and um, making mistakes and failing forward, you know, what do, you, do you accept cash on this property? Um, have you ever been foreclosed on by any of your, uh, or have any of your clients ever been foreclosed on? Have you ever been sued by a client? Uh, what type of marketing are you going to do? How long do you think the property is going to be vacant for? So it's just like any other type of employee um, business relationship. You know, we can't change, um, 
bad employees or, or vendors that aren't a fit, we can only screen them out on the, on the beginning and just manage them um, there on. So, um, oh yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to ask a question on something you said. Why would a property manager fire you? Great question. Um, for that particular, so this was an apartment complex we were repositioning in San Antonio. Um, and I'm, I'm of the firm belief that, um, you know, if, if, the, if the investment fails or if I fail, it's 100% my fault. If the investment does good and, and we profit, it's the team's uh, fault, if you will. It's, you know, the team made that possible. So, so with that deal, um, my mistake was I hired the wrong property management company. Um, they, they were more of like an A-class management company, as, at least that's what their products were. And that, that repositioning was more of like a, like a D-class, F-class apartment complex in a B-minus, C-plus type area. Um, they weren't paid enough. Uh, they didn't have the systems in place. And, um, you know, it just wasn't a right fit. So the, the team and, and the companies uh, that we work with now for that asset have been able to bring up the occupancy and make it cash flowing and reduce crime significantly. So it all comes back to that team and, and, um, and you know, matching up with the asset correctly. That makes a lot of sense. So it was just a, an appropriate separation. They weren't the right fit for the job, which sounds like with your 90 questions you ask property managers, you probably don't have that problem so much going forward. I mean, they just weren't a good fit from day one, sounds like. Right. Tell us then about what's in your portfolio now, because you're talking about Phoenix and San Antonio. So what have you got going on now? Sure. Uh, so I've been doing uh, what I got out of the rat race about two years ago. Um, fired the boss and uh, been able to help out other investors as well. Awesome. Um, currently, uh, thank you. I uh, currently have uh, 76 apartments and 49 houses. Wow. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's in uh, Phoenix, uh, San Antonio, Texas, Richmond, Virginia, and Kansas City, Missouri, and looking to expand to a couple other markets too, but have uh, phenomenal teams in those markets uh, to help me get there. Well, congratulations. That is huge success. And you're holding all those. So are you are not a flipper. You're just a holder. Is that true? Correct. Uh, I've done one flip. Um, but most of the time we, we want to go in and, and value add, improve the property and refinance it. Um, and it also depends because we, we do uh, raise capital as well. So if the investors are looking for um, a longer term solution that we make sure it's matched up with the asset. And, and most of them are more in the long term. Excellent. Well, that's really exciting. Hey, would you share with us, um, or, or you can be thinking about, we can talk about some other things, like kind of what's your, your biggest lesson you learned, and then maybe your most successful deal, if you have any numbers or general round numbers of um, one of your successful deals that you could share? Sure. Um, I think the, probably the, the, um, the deal that uh, was the most successful and ended up also being the, the most stressful. Um, ah. <laughs> and that was going back to that San Antonio deal. So that was a 52 unit apartment complex. Um, purchased that in um, December, 2012. And we structured it so it was uh, virtually no money down. We just paid for the, the broker commissions. Um, and that's because we found out what the, the sellers were looking for. They, they weren't necessarily just looking for the highest price at the longest closing, they, they want to get out of the asset as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So we were able to help them get there. Um, and it was basically, we assumed the commercial loan and then the seller carried the, the down payment. Um, and we just put the money into the rehab. So bought that property for about 1.3 million, put in about $350,000 into it. And then it recently appraised for, uh, it was about 2.4 million. And we did a wow. refinance. and. Yeah, we were able to pull out the equity, all the equity put into it and, and also improve the cash flow at the same time. Fantastic. I love it. Yeah, I would definitely say that's a good success story. Cool. What would you say um, was one of kind of your biggest lessons you've learned in your real estate investing path? Um, definitely that, the, that real estate investing is a business and it's not just about the properties. I, I feel like once you treat it like a business, it's, it's so much more enjoyable it's so much more fun and, and less stressful because if, if it's just, you know, about the properties, then um, I think as an investor, we kind of become commoditized, right? But if you have that system in place, um, your team can send you the exact assets that you're, you know, properties that you're looking for um, in the markets and be able to kind of treat it like a production line, if you will, right? Like mm -hmm. um, having inventory coming in, you know, improving it, flipping it, 
renovating it, whatever it be, and then exit strategy out of there. Um, and that, that's, you know, uh, it, it wasn't always like that for me personally, but um, the sooner you can scale, the sooner you can systematize it, um, you know, learning from Holly and, um, you know, she, she's kind enough to share her lessons on the, on the podcast and from the other um, interviews as well. Um, it, it, it really makes a difference with it. And, and that way you can make money when the market's going up, when the market's flat, and even on a down cycle too. Oh, I love that you said that. There is always opportunity. You've got to be flexible. You've got to change. I mean, I've only been in the business eight years. It's eight years this month that I bought my first flip. So nice. I don't have the same experience as some people. I've been through multiple cycles. But man, my techniques and strategies totally have had to change with the market. If you don't bend, you break or you die. Right. You just got to be flexible. All right, I've got a few more questions I want to get through here before we wrap it up. So, um, yeah. Why do you like houses more than apartments? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. <laughs> so, um, I, I would, I know that the audience is probably thinking that's maybe the first time they've heard that because it seems like, uh, you know, most of the real estate investing books out there, you know, or most of the investors that I, that I meet as well, they want to go away from the houses and do apartments, right? Because mm -hmm. you hear the big players talking about how, uh, apartments will have better cash flow. It's technically it's easier to manage, which I, I don't necessarily agree with. Um, but um, there there is good opportunity in apartments. Um, you know the maintenance is easier because you have one roof, and if you have 100 unit plus buildings, um, you can have a dedicated maintenance staff instead of having to go each property individually. But right now in 2016, there is a lot of money chasing apartments, and it's, it's very different than than five six years ago. Um, so there's, you know, when, when there's more money chasing a particular asset class, the cap rates will go down and the prices will go up. So I, I remember, you know, five, six years ago, uh, you could find great deals even on LoopNet, right? And now you definitely have to have a, a good broker relationship or have, um, you know, good teams to send you those deals. But um, it's, I, I, I have basically seen um, kind of a good opportunity. Like if you can manage houses like apartments, you can make it just as good, if not better, of an asset class. Um, you know, definitely not. Um, I, I don't self-manage, um, but you know, having a good team in place, they can make it so it's hassle-free. Um, you know, as those repairs coming in, there's there's after-hours uh, maintenance guys that, that can take care of that. Um, you know, work on tenant retention programs, and the good thing is there's a lot of financing available for that too. And with houses, if you have say a portfolio of ten houses versus a ten-unit apartment building. With any of those 10 houses, you could maybe sell off one of them, flip it. Uh, maybe if one of them is appreciating a little bit higher in that part of the town, you could do some extra renovations to it. But if you have that 10 unit apartment building, you're kind of stuck with that one particular ask, uh, that address. Mm -hmm. So it's just, I feel like there's a lot more uh, flexibility, a lot less competition, and um, a, a lot of great ROI available in those, those types of uh, single family deals. So are you experiencing a greater, higher ROI on the houses than apartments personally? Or is your portfolio pretty equal between them? Or how would you say your personal experience is? Well, currently I still own more uh, apartments than the houses, but the focus now is primarily to, to acquire portfolios of houses. Um, and we also acquire them even individually. So um, in, in one of the markets, the team is sending over off-market deals, you know, kind of one by one and assembling that portfolio. Uh, so what we like to do is, is uh, work with hard money and private investors to acquire the houses, flip them, um, we don't do them to the, the, the high quality that, that you do. It's more for like a rental type. You know, I, I, I wouldn't live in any of my properties. I'd love to live in the properties that you, you flip those. So, <laughs> but, you know, go in and improve the properties and then uh, refinance it with our, our lenders and then pull that capital out and just kind of rinse and repeat it. Love it. Okay. Um, also, uh, you were going to talk about self-managing versus hiring a property manager. When you're remote, like you are, you have to do a property manager, right? Right. And um, I mean, just me personally, even if the property was local, I, I still wouldn't manage it myself. Um, I, you know, would hire, you know, another property manager to do it. I'm not a broker. I don't have a real estate license. Um, and just to me, it, it becomes a single point of failure if, if I was managing the properties out of state. Because if I, if I get sick or if I can't pick up that phone call, then, um, you know, the business still has to be able to keep uh, running and, and be able to take care of the, the residents. And the great thing with the um, the companies that we have in place they're not like um, it's not really like a one man or one one woman type of show you know they have their own leasing agents their own maintenance team and all that stuff that they can help out with it so 
uh, just makes it a, little, uh, a lot less stressful to uh, be able to go on with it. Yeah, and definitely as you as one grows, as a person grows their portfolio, I'm okay managing mine. I've got 10. I've got great relationships with all my tenants, but that took a lot of time to develop and patience. But I was not willing to give up the control or pay a manager for the, the small group of homes I had, you know, to do it. Because if they're charging 10% and I have 10 houses, that's equivalent to a full month of rent on one of those houses. And so that's why I'm doing it myself. But if I were to grow my portfolio, like to your size, it wouldn't make sense. That's not a good use of my time if it started to take over my time. Right. But definitely you know, for our listeners, the larger you get, you want to systemize it, scale it, hire someone to do it. Even if it's someone personally hired by you and not a management company, it's not necessarily the best use of your time. If you can go find these awesome deals, add value and increase a deal value by a million bucks, that's way better than doing that low level management work for sure. All right, before we, oh gosh, I still wanna talk about Absolutely. finding seller finance deals and then how to find good emerging real estate markets. We still gotta hit those two points. So how do you find seller finance deals? My favorite kind. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> same here. <laughs> Um, so, um, instead of focusing kind of like what we were talking about earlier, instead of focusing on the deal itself, um, getting to know the seller, right. Finding out what the seller's needs, wants, and, and desires are, um, and, and structuring the LOI based on that. Um, I'd say probably more than half of the seller finance deals I've done were the deals that were done with brokers or, or, uh, uh realtors on the team to help out. Um, they said, you know, the seller is not looking to do that. They're not interested and, uh, you know, there's no way they'll take it. And when they, when they see the offer, you know, it's just surprisingly, you know, they'll, they'll still be open to it. Um, not every case, but we don't know unless we ask, right? Um, Amen. Yes. I've hit the same thing. No, no, no. We don't want that. We, they won't take that. And then say, well, I can offer you this lower price for a cash or a higher price with seller financing where the seller just becomes the bank. Like I try and break it down easy terms so it's not scary. And then that realtor with their guard up that says, no, no, no. They're like, oh, well, maybe that's a possibility. <laughs> yeah, and I love the way you, you explain that too. Um, Cause it's, it's, um, it's interesting. I mean, even from their perspective, right? If, if they do get that lump sum of cash, where are they gonna put it? And they're probably gonna get taxed on it, right? So yeah the way you describe it is like that kind of helps them mitigate that, that tax risk as well in the capital gains. Um, right. So yeah, I, I'd like to do the same thing, you know, you know, two or three different options on every offer. So I think that's definitely a good way to get more seller finance deals, you know, all cash seller financing and maybe, you know, commercial financing or, or residential financing is a third option. Um, Craigslist has been really good. Uh, definitely the brokers, you know, uh, flippers, wholesalers, you know, build those relationships, take care of that team, um, and they'll take care of you. They'll, they'll constantly send the deals over. Uh, Co-compliance is a really good way uh, to find those types of problem properties if that's, um, you know, what the investor identity is. Um, and, you know, just always be marketing. Meth labs, look for the meth lab, because, hey, maybe that uh, <laughs> landlord's ready to sell that meth lab house. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, and last question here, how to find good emerging real estate markets, because you definitely play in more than one market and not your own backyard. Yeah, and, and surprisingly, it's not as, um, I mean, it, it, we did go through a lot of challenges with it, but um, when, when you have those good teams in place, it's, it's um, very much, it becomes a passive investment, yeah, even though I do it actively. But when you're looking for markets, I think if, if you want to be, um, if you want to be in markets for the long term, um, so this won't necessarily apply to flips, but um, try to look for markets where the population is 200,000 people or greater and job growth is at least 2% for the last two years and population growth of 2% for the last two years. Um, cause there's a lot of cheap markets, say like Flint, Michigan, where, um, you know, the properties are dirt cheap, but the population has been declining and there's not really a lot of businesses going over there. Right. And the tenants need those businesses in order to provide rent. Yeah. So, uh, uh, there's, and there's a couple of good books on it. David Lindahl has a really good book on emerging real estate markets. Um, and, um, you know, if you know, if you know a particular, um, area has job diversity, that's also a good thing. So, you know, um, not not really being in a market where it's it's heavily dependent on one particular industry, but if you know, uh, say Tesla is going to come over and build a gigafactory, and you know you can you can kind of do some homework to see what the odds are of them going into that market, and do the numbers make sense with or without them? I think that would be a good way to 
um, for a safer long-term investing strategy. Yeah, that's a very good point. Or sometimes there's military-based towns where if the military base shuts down, there goes your entire you know, tenant base. So definitely exactly. be aware of that. Well, this has been really awesome, interesting, and helpful. Thank you so much. Um, as we close out here, I'd love to hear your advice for a new beginning real estate investor before we sign off here. What's your best advice for someone new? Yeah, I, and I appreciate you having me on here. Um, definitely an investment in your financial education is the best investment. So keep listening to Holly's podcast. Um, when, when she or any of the guests recommend any of the books, write them down and listen to the audio books, go to the networking seminars and, and ask questions. You want to be, um, you want to be surrounding yourself with, uh, you know, the, the right, uh, 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 people that are doing it and that you can learn from. So that's, that's an investment that will pay off, uh, awesome. dividends. Yeah. Education is super important. So now how can people learn more about what you're doing? And maybe you can give us a little teaser about your project that you mentioned before and um, give us your contact info too. Sure. Um, so uh, I don't currently have a website up, but we are working on a, pla a crowdfunding platform. Um, so I can uh, hopefully give some more details later on, but um, best way to find me now just on Facebook. Uh, so it's my full name, facebook.com slash separate Dot become, um, or if you have any questions, feel free to send an email, sepherb1 at gmail.com. Awesome. So we'll have that all typed out in the show notes in case you couldn't catch that. So thank you so much again for sharing all your wisdom and knowledge. And we could definitely have some people that might be interested in participating in your crowdfunding opportunities because probably, I mean, you are just so knowledgeable. I'm so impressed with what you've learned and done and accomplished. So my hard hat is off to you. <laughs> thank you very much, Charlie. Appreciate well, it. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs> thank you for your time and we're signing off. Hey there, thanks for watching the video. Make sure you like it and click subscribe to get notified of more videos. And you can go to hardhatholly.com for a free download on secrets to finding great deals.